Tana Botterell. I'm a junior at the college studying social studies, particularly focusing on democratization and migration in the Americas, and I serve as co-chair of the JFK Junior Forum here at the Institute of Politics. When we first officially confirmed that Professor Levitsky and Ziblatt would be speaking at tonight's event, I was absolutely thrilled, as to this day, Gov20 with Professor Levitsky was one of my absolutely favorite classes that I've taken here at Harvard since coming. So now you guys all have the opportunity to hear from not just Professor Levitsky, but also Professor Ziblatt, and you have the added benefit of not having a midterm or a final exam after this conversation. So relish in that, truly. Um, to many, democracy appears an inherent fixture of the United States of America. Robert Dahl perhaps puts it, puts it best, claiming that to reject the democratic creed is in effect to refuse to be an American. That said, in a recent poll from the IOP's own Harvard Public Opinion Project, student researchers found that 59% of young Democrats and 61% of young Republicans believed that the opposite party was a threat to American democracy. This is not, however, a strictly American phenomenon. More than a quarter of the world's population now live in democratically backsliding countries. It appears we're in an unprecedented era of democracy's instability. And thus, Levitsky and Ziblatt's book, How Democracies Die, and their subsequent re research proves more timely now than ever. With that said, it's an honor to introduce tonight's guests for what's sure to be a fascinating and timely conversation. Professor Stephen Levitsky is the David Rockefeller Professor of Latin American Studies and Professor of Government here at Harvard University. He's also the director of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies, and his research focuses on democratization and authoritarianism, political parties, and weak and informal institutions with a focus on Latin America. Daniel Ziblatt is Eaton Professor of the Science of Government at Harvard University and the Director of the Transformations of Democracy Group at the WZB Berlin Social Science Center. He specializes in the study of Europe and the history of democracy. Professor Levitsky and Ziblatt are the co-authors of How Democracies Die, which is a New York Times bestseller and was published in 25 different languages. They're currently working on a book on the rise of and reaction against multiracial democracy here in the United States. Tonight's conversation will be moderated by former IOP resident fellow, Latasha Brown. Latasha Brown is the co-founder of Black Voters Matter Fund, a power-building Southern-based civic engagement organization that played an instrumental role in the 2017 Alabama U.S. Senate race. She's also the principal owner of the Truth Speaks Consulting Incorporated, a philanthropy advisory consulting firm in Atlanta, Georgia, and she serves as the founding project director of Grant Makers for Southern Progress. With that, please join me in a round of applause welcoming this evening's guests. Thank you. Greetings, Harvard. <laughs> I've missed this space. So I want to jump right into the conversation. A lot is going on. This is going to be a really fun conversation. We're talking about will democracy survive um, globally. And so I want to start, I just want to start the conversation. I want to talk globally and then we can talk about what's happening in the US. And Daniel, I want to bring this question to you. You know, since this is a conversation about global democracy, just this week we saw in Italy, right? It's like it, what is old has become new again, right? So we saw in um, Italy where Maloney has won, who is a fascist, you know, and we see wh while that has happened where she's won, we also see in, in France where, um, um, where we see Le, Le Pen did not win, she got 17% of the vote, but the significance, it's the largest vote share of a fascist that we've seen in that country. And so I'm really interested in, from, um, in hearing from you around kind of the state of democracy globally, and does there, is there an impact on what just recently happened in Italy? Yeah, so that, I think the Italian, well, first, thanks for doing this. It's been, thanks to you, everybody, for coming. It's great to be here with everybody. Um, the, I think what's interesting about the Italian, well, first of all, what's important about the Italian elections is that this is the first time that uh, if, if the government forms and so on, and she's the head of a government, that a party with roots in the fascist era right. is running uh, a government in Italy. Um, and so, you know, this is a major development. It's a major threat. Um, and it's t to be taken seriously. I mean, there's a temptation and there's some press in Europe that says, well, this is just normal democratic politics. They got elected, they're not wa you know, marching around in black shirts and so on, so they're not really fascists. And you know, I think that understates the scale, the significance of it. That said, I do also think that you know, it, it, it's important to understand that the right in Italy basically got the same vote share that it got in the past. And what's happened is a lot of the voters moved from other right parties mm -hmm. to this uh, neo-fascist party, a uh, party with roots in fascism. And 
from my view, one of the things that really uh, the Italian experience teaches us is the failure of the other par parties to coordinate. Because in fact, you know, she only got 26 or so percent of the vote, which is, you know, if you look around the world, most countries, most democracies have about 20 to 25 percent of the uh, electorate who votes for parties like this. So she's able to form a coalition. She'll be able to form a coalition because the Democratic left kind of fell apart. Other parties fell apart. The center parties fell apart. There's a five-star movement, which is a kind of another independent party. But essentially, you have the rest of the electorate, or the, the rest of the political spectrum that fell apart. And so it's, it's a failure of a strategy of containment. I think that's one of the lessons. And that it's necessary to have these broad coalitions. It's difficult to form broad coalitions against these kinds of parties. And that's what that, the failure of that, in part, explains why she will now be in power. So since there's a multi-party system, I'm thinking about the US, and we've got this two-party system, and I'm just wondering, even in that particular example, are there some key lessons that yeah. you think that we can learn here in the US as we're thinking about this new this threat, this growing threat to democracy here? Yeah, so I guess two points I would make. One, that there is, one has to deal with the popularity of these parties. I mean, there's reasons why these parties are, are successful, that, you know, disaffection with politics, disaffection with the economy, a sense that the world is not improving, and a kind of general sense of malaise and so on. That's one thing, and a lot of people talk about that, and I think that's important. But I think the other part of the story is what do the mainstream parties, what do mainstream politicians, how do they respond to this? And do they overlook their own internal differences to realize that there's a threat out there? Mm -hmm. And so I think thinking about the United States, you know, a majority of Americans are broadly speaking, I would say, li liberal Democrats and, or believe in liberal democracy. Uh, you know, voters do. I think voters believe in a lot of, uh, and share, have a lot of shared values. The problem is that, that there's lots of internal divisions and I think those uh, kind of broad coalition, because it's so broad, can sometimes fall apart. And so I think that focusing on the, on the real threat is really important. So I want to bring you in, Steve. I, want, I really want to hear from both of you, because I, as I do the work uh, at Black Voters Matter, the work that we're doing, we're really concerned. On the ground, pro-democracy groups, we're really concerned about the state of democracy, right? What is happening here? We see elements of, of, of fascism, of, of neo-fascism here. We see the attacks on voting rights from Georgia to other places. Um, we see this, this rise in what it seems like white supremacist talking points and, and political polarization. And so given that, you know, one of the arguments that both of you have talked about is that you, there's been these two master norms that have been set by political parties, that for the most part in your book you talk about political parties being like the gatekeepers, being the gatekeepers of democracy. And as long as there were those two norms, one um, being the norm of, of neutral tolerance that essentially was legitimacy that each party saw the other party, whether you liked them or not, as legitimate, and then the second one being forbearance, which essentially was having restraint to not use tools against, um, to, to get power. And we're seeing kind of a shift from that. You know, but, but given that, I, I, as, a, as a black woman from the South, you know, I would actually argue that the political parties traditionally have not only played a gatekeeper uh, around protecting democracy, but they've also been a gatekeeper of protecting a particular kind of democracy, right, that was not inclusive, and that there's always been a tolerance in this country to put away even those two, those two norms, those two master norms, when race was injected, right? And so in some ways, I think we're seeing ourselves play, this itself, play itself out. You know, examples of that to me would be in 1964 with Fannie Lou Hamer, who, who those, the, those Democratic uh, representatives were duly elected and should have been seated, were not seated. We can talk about post-reconstruction. So there's examples of how those norms are put to the side. So I, I, in, the, in light of currently where we are in America, we've a nation that America has always been majority white. We know that there's demographic shifts, so this is a nation that is not, that is about to be majority minority. And so I'm just interested in kind of your thinking about what norms, if any, both of you, and I want to start with you, Steve, you know, what, what will be the new democratic norms if we're actually moving towards, we're saying protecting, strengthening, or reasserting democracy in this country, particularly given the history of how race is played with being, people being okay at putting, putting those norms to the side. <laughs> All right. So a couple of, of points. We, we in, in How Democracy Die, which we wrote five years ago, we worried a lot about the, uh, the erosion of these two norms that you mentioned. We also took uh, care to point out that those norms were strong precisely because the political, they, those norms were strong when the political community 
was limited to basically to white Christians. Mm -hmm. And it is, it's not an accident that norms, that our parties began to polarize and those norms began to fray precisely when we opened up the, the, the political community. 1964, 1965, when the United States becomes a, a full democracy uh, and, t and begins to take steps towards multiracial democracy, it's at that point that you begin to see, you, you see the, the kernel of the unraveling that we're seeing today. Because it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge in Italy, it's a challenge everywhere. The challenge of diversity, of, of building a multiracial democracy has turned out to be a hell of a lot harder than we anticipated. So we were worried five years ago about the erosion of norms as we became a more inclusive democracy. That's still an issue, but I think the, the, the level of alarm has reached a new level in, in the book that we're writing now. We are now at a place that we, we didn't anticipate even five years ago, mm. and we were thinking about this stuff. We're at a point where a major political party in the United States is abandoning not just norms, it's abandoning democracy, right? right? There, are, there are basically two critical rules for any political party that wants to call itself democratic, small d democratic. You have to accept, always accept the results of elections, and you have to always, under all circumstances, renounce violence. Any political party that is unable to accept the results of elections and that condones, uh, tolerates, endorses violence is not a democratic mm -hmm. political party. So we're in a position today where one of our two political parties can no longer be called, is, is no longer committed to democratic rules of the game. So this is a, a new terrain. Uh, and defending, so it is only when we reconsolidate, reestablish our democracy um, so that it is not under threat that we can, I think, even begin to talk about rebuilding democratic norms. But the norms that we, there's no going back to the good old days of the 1950s, right? right? Nobody, God knows nobody wants to, well, half the country wants to go back. Well, right, right. I don't so want to go back. People do want to go back. I don't want to go right, back. Right, okay. Um, <laughs> we don't want to go back. There's no going back. There is no going back, That's like right. it or not to the 1950s, right? We, we're going to have to develop political norms, norms of toleration and legitimacy in a much, much more diverse, much more inclusive society. And that's gonna be a challenge. It is, and I wanna know from you, Daniel, what would that look like? Well, you know, so I, I think this notion of mutual toleration is necessary for democracy. In mm -hmm. order for competition to take place, you do have to think the other side is legitimate. And I think we're in a, situ we're in a situation, though, where we have this new dilemma, where a, a political party doesn't accept election results, condones violence. I think it's a mistake to think that then that means you have to tolerate that and just say, well, mm. okay, they're just the other side. I think that's not right. I mean, I think the lessons of history are you need to take a very strong stand against political parties that assault democracy. There was a German legal theorist in the 1930s, writing in 1932, who was a, who was a liberal, liberal the, uh, constitutional theorist, and with the Nazis on the horizon a year before they came to power, he said, if you really believe in democracy, you have to be willing to go down on the sinking ship. Um, you know, and a year later, the Nazis came to power. He fled the country. Uh, you know, that, so you, know, you can't just have an open mind against the, uh, towards the other side. So I think taking a strong stand against the other side is necessary. Um, on the other end, the, the dilemma that we're in, though, of course, is that you do, in order for an alternation of power to take place, and in order for each election not to feel like it's a national emergency if the other side wins, you have to accept the legitimacy of their, the other side. So we're in this, I think we're in a bind. I mean, that's a real dilemma. You know, I'm not sure what the way out is. I think, the, I mean, the, clearly the way, I mean, one at, one, at a very general level, maybe this is too abstract of a level, we need to have parties that are committed to democratic rules. And if you have parties that are democratic, committed to democratic rules, then you can afford this norm of toleration. But as long as we don't have that, you know, we're, we're, we're in a real tough bind. And so, speaking of parties, because I'm glad yeah. you brought up parties. Yeah. So when we look at even the history of parties, parties have been, uh, both political parties in this country have a history that they have not been very representative. When we look at the Senate, when we look at some of the other pieces that are in place um, from Electoral College and other, um, uh, other elements that have not lent itself to actually have a pluralist, um, pluralist uh, a democracy or representative reflective democracy. How do we get there? In light of the history, has not been in such a way that the political parties have been, con been de uh, dedicated to having a reflective democracy. In light of what is happening in this environment we're in right now, where one party, in many ways, have imploded, <laughs> right, and, and, and abandoned that altogether, then how do we get to restoring a democracy or re a re representative democracy in America? 
Um, I mean, a couple of things. First of all, I mean, the, the, the Republican Party is, in some senses, very representative. It's representative of a, of a, of, of a white Christian majority in decline. Mm -hmm. that, feels, uh, I don't, that feels like I'm the sorry. country that it grew up in is being taken away. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a constituency that is reacting against multiracial democracy. And the Republicans are representing that constituency relatively well. The, Demo the Democratic Party, I don't want to get too deep into the Democratic Party, but they have, they have a really hard job because they, in effect, are representing everybody else in a very, very big, heterogeneous, diverse country. I think a couple of things about, about the, the, can the I, I'm gonna interrupt you, which okay. is totally unusual, but since we're buddies here, I can do this. You said, you said the Republican Party represents a white Christian majority in decline. I mean, it's, let's be clear, the Republican Party doesn't represent a majority of anybody. I mean, so it's, okay, you know, point. and so, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, so let's not overstate the, you know, they don't <laughs> win a majority. The former majority. Yes. There yes. Go. Okay. Good yeah, point. Thank you for interrupting. Yeah. <laughs> Two things. I think the, Dem the Democratic Party is beginning to represent uh, non-white voters. Forty-three percent of Democratic Party votes are non-white votes. You, we, we can argue about whether uh, non-white politicians and activists are getting the voice and the power that they, that they ought to have in the party, but the Democratic Party is, you know, if you compare it certainly to where it was in 1964, you mentioned, right. but even if you compare it to the Bill Clinton era, this is a very different party. But the way, the way to, to ensure to speed that process of representation up ensure that everybody can vote. If everybody voted in this country, I mean, there, there are democracies, legitimate democracies, that require all citizens to vote. And most other democracies in the world at least make it easy for people to vote. We are the only established democracy in the world that, that, uh, that allows governments to make it hard for people to vote. If everybody voted in this country, the, pro the, de the Democratic Party would be compelled to do a better job of representing everybody rather than just uh, it's, it's, just it's no insane. accident that in this election on Sunday in Italy had among the lowest voter turnouts turn in Italian history you know so there were a lot of people who didn't vote which partly I think explains you know but I would actually offer that the repression gets actually greater when there's a higher voter turnout uh, particularly in communities of color right and so there is a reaction there is a backlash those of us who are doing political organizing on the ground, you know, we know that we expect it. I, I shared something earlier with you, Steve, with my grandfather. My grandfather was born in 1905, um, died at 104, uh, was almost 104, which means that he was alive when Obama was running, right? And he said, he, he, he loved Obama. He said, Cal, I like that boy. I think he's gonna win. He said, but y'all gonna catch hell. <laughs> right, and I knew exactly what he meant because he felt that there was a possibility, which is interesting because I think my grandfather was probably more progressive than I was at the time and really being able to see that, that Obama could win, but he also, there was, in that, you know, he had lived enough years that he knew that there would be a backlash. I also recall if there were, and there are probably people in the audience, I also recall had, when we actually saw, um, uh, when, on Inauguration Day, many African Americans, maybe some, I don't know, experienced this in this room, that when Obama and his wife were walking down the street during the inauguration, we were literally saying, get back in the car, get back in the car, because we were convinced that they were gonna be assassinated, right? So even the idea of, and there were many that I know that felt that way, my aunt was actually upset, like, why won't he get back in the car? And so I'm saying that because, you know, part of what, what we know is that race has played a factor in the shaping of the political landscape. And we are entering this kind of new, this new space um, where America will be a majority minority country. What does that mean to the systems that we currently have, right? And, and some level, we know that they won't lend itself to, to pluralism, right? But what does that mean about establishing new democratic norms? Because if one party, even if the question of, I mean, we, 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 if you want to say legitimacy, there's a question around, there's still a question in America right now around the legitimacy of black voters having the same access as other voters, right? So that in itself says something. So as we're looking at democracy going forward, and we said, well, we can't go backwards, what are some of the elements that we have got to address and going forward to have a kind of democracy to get us to the place where literally it is closer to a true democracy where there's one person, one vote. I think it's critical to change the rules of our political system to make our democracy more democratic. Uh, certainly there's resistance to that. When groups are, lose status, when groups lose their position in a hierarchy, they're gonna push back against it. Mm -hmm. But the only way forward is to democratize a democracy. And 
you know, I think there's lots of things that people are talking about on the, on the American political agenda of, you know, change, you know, getting rid of the electoral college or reforming the electoral college, making it easier to vote, expanding the size of Congress. There's all sorts of institutional reforms, and these are all very difficult uh, institutional reforms to achieve, but they're absolutely necessary. And, I, and, and so I, I think that this is the only way to, um, you know, the, the major, major, again, I think I, I want to emphasize this point again, majorities are on the, on the right side on this. I think majorities of Americans basically believe in democracy, and so we need to have our institutions reflect that. We were talking about this at breakfast. I think for the first time in the entire history of this country, we have a majority, not a huge one, but a majority in this country in favor of multiracial democracy that, that adheres to the core principles of multiracial democracy, which I would define as, uh, as acceptance of diversity and a belief in racial equality. I don't think there's ever been a period in history when you could say that a majority of the American people endorse those principles. In the 21st century, that's the case. The, the issue now is allowing that majority to express itself. Therein lies the problem. <laughs> so so, I, so I'm, I'm wondering, let's, let's go there. Let's talk about race. And let's talk about, because there are two things. There is participation and then there's power. And so there is representing when we're talking about voters, right? When you look at who makes the electorate, then that's one, that's one set of factors, right? Um, and that's more diverse. But when you actually look at power and who is in positions of power, that is a different set of, of, of people, right? And so there's structural, there, there are structural issues that have created uh, making it more difficult for some populations to be represented than others. And so as we go forward with this shifting demographics, you know, I am wondering what role will race play? And I mean, we know what kind of, I, I, I guess I feel, I have my own opinion of what role it plays now, but in the shaping of democracy going forward, what role will, will, will race play in the shaping of this new democracy, or is it just a reclaiming of the democracy that we've had before? It has to be more than reclaiming a democracy. I mean, that the, there is no reclaiming right. of something that you know didn't exist. So, I think it's about that's that's why you know I, I sometimes think it's a mistake to say you know we're restoring democracy or how do we how do we protect democracy as as if it were as if it was you know fully thriving. I mean, I, I agree with Steve that the U.S. in fact is in many ways more democratic in 2016 than it was at any point in American history. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, with all its flaws, that's, you know, it's, one could make that case. Nonetheless, it's, that's clearly not sufficient. And so it's about moving forward. It's about transforming democracy and making it more democratic. It's not about going back to some period that doesn't exist. You know, and I, I think that's interesting that you're saying that because in some ways when you hear kind of the talking points related to it, the, the talking points, I think, particularly even from democratic strategists, dem are, are how do we how do we protect what we have? You know, how do we take it back? Even from the president, I think we've heard um, this this idea that democracy, that in some ways, I think that's built out of this American exceptionalism, that in some way America had achieved democracy and now it's just being threatened. And and I rarely hear the evolution of what a democracy, what it would make for systems change to create a more representative and inclusive democracy. So, you know, our, our, the definition of multiracial democracy that we use is really basic. Okay. It, it, uh, a democracy is a system in which all adults can vote and enjoy basic civil liberties, uh, be uh, free speech, right of assembly, association, uh, and press. A multiracial democracy is simply one in which individuals of all ethnic groups enjoy those rights equally. That's not asking a lot. That's a basic democracy. So what, what are the markers? Oh, that's just easy work, isn't it? <laughs> when, when, when we have data that show that, that uh, Latino and, and African American men are treated the same by the police and by the justice system as whites, that'll be a marker. You were telling me about uh, people you work with in, in Alabama waiting five, eight, 11 hours in Georgia. Georgia. In, in Georgia, Georgia. sorry. In Georgia. Um, when, when they wait 11 minutes to vote like I do, that'll be a marker, right? When, when, when members of each ethnic group are, uh, have equal access, truly equal access to the ballot, equal protection by the police and by the courts, then we can talk about multiracial democracy. That's where we need to go.
And I, and I think that, just digging into that, I agree with that. I think the part that is not discussed, I think the part that is not even in public discourse a lot, is around how do we get there? Because often what dominates public discourse around democracy and American democracy is how do we preserve what we have? As if what we have is the ultimate expression of democracy, right? And so I, I am, frank, I struggle with it myself as a, a person who does pro-democracy work. You know, I struggle with this whole notion of what does it look like? Oftentimes, I, when I'm working with young folks or when I'm doing um, trainings, I ask, I ask us to really think we have to radically reimagine what exactly American democracy is gonna go forward. But that's really not in the public discourse around that we have to have something different. It is dominated at this point around, even particularly by pro-democracy people, about maintaining what we have. And so I'm just wondering if, and I know you all are working on a book, and so I don't want to give all the, good, the goodies before the book comes out, but I'm just wondering if there are one or two things that you think that just unequivocally, each one of you, if there's one thing that you think unequivocally has to change and has to shift for us to get closer to a reflective, representative democracy. Look, I think there are, there are two stages. First of all, we do have to defend our democracy, right? There is mm -hmm. an imminent authoritarian Absolutely. threat in this country, and we need to build a very broad coalition to defend what we have. What we then need to do is, is finish this transition to multiracial democracy. And I think it's going, what, getting back to, to something I, I said before, we need, to, we, need to, we need a set of institutional reforms that allow majorities to govern. I think one, uh, easier access to the vote. Uh, two, we need to get rid of the Electoral College. Three, ideally we need a more democratic Senate. It is, it, it, you were never going to um, empower minorities while Wyoming has the same representation in the Senate as California as New York, yeah. uh, or New York. Now that's a very hard thing to do, but if you want to talk about getting us closer to democracy, we need a, a set of institutions that actually permit majority rule. Um, what's it gonna take to get there? It's, it's going to take more than people like me writing books. Mm -hmm. It's going to take uh, mobilization on the streets. It's going to take uh, particularly young people, the mm -hmm. young people who mobilized in the summer of 2020. Um, that was a democracy movement. And it's, go it's gonna take quite a bit of mobilization. I think that, and, and, they, and young people will never, never mobilize around the idea of bringing us back to the 1980s, right? right? They don't right, do that's not right. I may want to go back to the 1980s, right. but it, it's, it's going, we're going to have to create a vision of a multiracial democratic future that can be something that we're proud of, something that can be a model for the world. And so given that, I don't know if there's some. Yeah, well, I would just add to the list, that, I mean, the, and, and lo more low-hanging fruit in a way is filibuster reform. I mean, this may seem very technical. It's in one, <laughs> one body of the, you know, of the federal government and the, and the Senate, and you know, but this this requirement that you have 60 votes in order to pass a bill is, is you know, is, uh, a, an, it's anti-democratic. Uh, it doesn't. It's not in the Constitution, despite what some people think. It hasn't been around since the founding, despite what people think. Uh, it's a it's a relatively recent rule in, in its current practice. And you know, there's defenders of it, and you know, I know all, we you know we know all the arguments about oh, this leads to bipartisanship, this leads to compromise. You know, we don't really have a lot of bipartisanship and compromise, and we have this rule. So, uh, you know, I think there's really good arguments for getting. And, and, and in order to get rid of it, all that's requires is the, a, a Senate. It's a Senate rule, so this, this a Senate majority has to pass this rule. You know, has to I can change that's this right. rule. And so, and, and just this last year, uh, the Senate Democrats, in their own caucus, tried to reform this, uh, it was blocked by just a couple of senators, so it came very close, and I think that this is a kind of, this is like this point in the political system that blocks lots of other things, blocks a lot of mm -hmm. these other reform uh, I items, and so this is something that really, I, that I think is the first thing that needs to go. And so, is there something you want to share, you wanna add on? So where we are now, and we're thinking 10 years from now, I'm just interested in uh, think how you all see kind of the trajectory of where we headed a decade from now? My take, I think that in the um, 10 years from now, it's, it's gonna be rough. I think we're headed for about a generation of, of, of pretty nasty politics. I think American democracy is going to be sliding in and out of crisis. Uh, the, and you know, there could be crises that make 2020 look like a garden party. 
Uh, there could be a fair amount of violence. Uh, there could there could be a stolen election. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there may be brief periods of undemocratic rule. I think we're headed for a, a period of intense conflict. In the longer term, particularly when I look at the numbers in this country and the way public opinion has shifted, and particularly young people, the opinions of, of younger people, yeah. I, I, I'm actually much more optimistic. Absolutely. I think we're gonna get there. It's gonna take a little while. Mm. Is there something that you think that is really driving kind of th that will continue to drive this, this division um, and this intensity, and there's, is there something that you think can quell that right now? I, I don't think that, there's anything. That, I, you don't I'm think there's anything that can... Really? I mean, I, th I think we really? have to... Wait, what, I, what, what don't you think? I don't get, what, is there anything that can quell, quell the conflict right now? What is happening right now? Yeah. Wow. It's, you know, and so you know, people wow. often ask us, <laughs> You know, are there countries that have gone through this kind of experience and that step back from the brink and everything's restored? And, and whenever anybody asks us that question, we're always sort of stumped. You know, I mean, I think it's, you know, it, I, I, another way of putting Steve's point that maybe um, isn't as, as oh. you know, dark, I guess. But I, I mean, I agree with it. I agree. You know, each national election because I think we're already lit. I think people are imagining this really. And this is, you know, th this mm. idea that each election is a national emergency. That, my God, this next election, what's going to mm. happen? I mean, how many times can you do that before you kind of lose your mind, right? You know, each every four years, every two years, I it's mean, exhausting. every midterm election, you kind of think, what if, you know, what if the other side doesn't accept the elections? What if there's violence in the streets? And that's that's a kind of anxiety that's just, you know, it, that's that's the moment that we're in, and that's kind of, the, I think that that can, if that continues, that's this stuff accumulates. I mean, that, and another thing I would also say is that. You know, we sometimes think of you know this sort of Trump as an aberration, or isn't he an aberration? He's a symptom of deeper problems. You know, when I think of like French political history, you know, there are these different regimes in French political history. Where Bonaparte comes onto the scene, Napoleon comes onto the scene, and then his nephew comes onto the scene. You know, you know, 50 years later, and once this kind of politics is injected into a political system, right. it doesn't just disappear. It's part of the political culture now. Mm -hmm. And so how do you, and you can't just sort of erase it and pretend like this didn't happen. This is now part of the political culture, and it's in some sense a permanent part of our political culture, and we just have to learn how to figure out how to cope with it. And so that, that's what also makes me pessimistic. Can I say one thing? So the reason I don't think this is going away, that there's much okay. we can do to make this go away, this, this is a big deal, right? The, 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 the white Christian majority that dominated this country for two centuries losing not only its majority but its dominant status right. is a big freaking deal. Right? Mm. We're talking about people mm. who believe that the country that they grew up in is being taken away from them. The very idea of a white Christian America is being obliterated. That's, that, that's a radicalizing thing. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, so MAGA forces are not going away. Mm. They're not going away. And so they have to be defeated politically. And so if we want to hurry up that process, we, there's nothing we can do to snap our fingers and fix this, this conflict tomorrow. But we can defeat them politically. And that's going to take the construction of a broad coalition. It's going to take a coalition that includes elements of the small d democratic forces on the right, business, religious leaders, Republicans, uh, a, 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 a coalition that expands beyond blue states. <coughs> Uh, mm -hmm. to, to win, and the sooner that we win politically, that we defeat them politically, that Dem not the Democratic Party, small d Democratic forces, defeat the MAGA forces, the sooner we do that, the sooner we'll be able to begin to talk about rebuilding our democracy. I hear you, because what I'm hearing you, and I think that that's some of the theory of our work, that we've got to win, right? But it's, it is also becoming much more challenging in many ways. When you're looking at voter suppression, across the board spread, when you're looking at other elements, you know, we, I often talk about these three things of, of, of how you look at voter suppression in this nation. If you, historically, there's always been these three strategies. One strategy has been about restricting access to the ballot. Another strategy is around creating this culture of fear. And then there's also been this strategy around weaponizing the administrative process. And we're seeing all of those in action, and they're in, in action right now. And it does have, it has, it has an impact on the electric. Now, of course, the, the good thing is finally, you know, my mother was a part of the baby boomers. Now you have a shift, not just in demographics as it relates to, to race, but also in age. And so now you have the baby boomers are now trumped by young voters. And so since you have, no pun intended, 
you know, while we have these young voters uh, and, and this, this, this diversity and this shifting electorate, how do you all, as, as scholars, democracy scholars, how do you think and, and, and how do we approach, I know in the next 10 years you're like, it's gonna be a rough ride, right? And there's nothing that can quell what we're gonna go through. But there should be something that we're doing right now, I would think, to get us to this point, to have this more reflective democracy, right? And even in the meantime, around the winds, do you see the winds centered on, on issues? Are they issue-based winds? Do you see them as geographic winds, or we just, need to be focused on this coalition of just winning and winning yeah. everything. I mean, the, be the beauty of democracy, the reason I'm a fan of democracy is that it contains a self-correcting mechanism. Mm -hmm. That is that it, it, you can solve problems, and the way that the self-correction takes place is by winning and losing. When one side loses, it has to change course. And so that's why winning is so important, because it, it, not only does it allow you to implement your own agenda, but it convinces the other side that it's, on, it's doing something wrong. And it, mm -hmm. and it, and, and just like a firm that wants to stay in business, you know, wants to survive, it, if it loses customers, you're gonna have to regroup. And so I think winning is key because it sends them, it allows the democratic process to unfold. So, I, you know, whether that, you know, and the, the particular strategies <coughs> of how to win, I mean, we're not, I'm not a politician. I mean, this is what, you know, professional politicians know what the issues are. They should figure out what the issues are to win. But I just know that in order for a self-correcting, this self-correcting mechanism of democracy to work, one side has to win, the other side has to lose, and that's the way the process of adaptation takes place. And to that point, okay, we win. We have electorate that are making these decisions, but we also have longstanding institutions that have a certain kind of history and a behavior as well. And so what, as, we're, as we're winning these elections, right, there's also going to have to take something else to get us to this point, right, as we're looking at institutions. And I'm wondering if either you have any thoughts around, like, in terms of how do we get there? Is that, is that we create? Uh, how do we get the point that we have the electorate to push for those kind of institutional changes, and how would you prioritize that? Let's say in the next ten years, that you think would lend itself to. Well, I think ta talking about this stuff, and I mean, social, the way that po po politicians want to win office, and so they respond to social pressure, and so social movements, and people talking about these issues, and putting pressure on politicians to address these issues. That, I mean, this is. This is the way that, uh, again, that, that democracy is supposed to work. And so, Paul, you know, it's uh, often the reformers in American history have been pretty conservative defenders of the status quo, and it's only under pressure and under duress when they realize that the public winds are changing that they then have to change course. And so I think that's the only way that this kind of thing happens. So and talking about it is a, is a part, part of that. Of yeah. And there's a reason, I mean, when, when we first wrote <coughs> How Democracy Die, it wasn't that long ago, um, nobody in the United States thought about it. Democracy in the United States being right. under threat. Well, some we of got, us did. Yeah, some fair. of us did. Excellent yeah, point. Yeah, okay. All right. Excellent point. Like, <laughs> I take that but back. We, yeah, we wrote right. this article called, Is Donald Trump a Threat to Democracy? And, it's, and it, was so, it was so, like, oh my God, this is this crazy article. Joe and Scarborough right. laughed at us. Yeah. L right. Listen, I yeah. remember, ironically, I remember um, seeing, a, uh, seeing a show, um, and I think it was an interview where President Obama, who wasn't president at the time, the senator at the time, being asked about Trump, and he said, and he literally said, this is on camera, he was like, Trump will, listen y'all, Trump won't ever win, right? There were some of us who literally said, listen y'all, the writing is on the wall, the writing is on the wall, and people did not listen. And those who actually had experience, and I can say even those of in the Deep South, because I remember having this conversation with a group of funders, I remember having a, a conversation with a group of funders about, you know, whether, you know, it was almost creating this false equivalency that, oh, this was just a Republican and a Democrat and there was these two people. We were like, no, there's a different threat that we see Trump is bringing in. You know, and the question became, the question wasn't, could we live with Trump? Because our position, even in that meeting, was we live with Trump all the time. We live in the deep south, right? Uh, 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 there are, that, that kind of level um, is not the question is can you deal can you live with Trump and it changed the dynamics of that conversation but it was interesting because we were there were those of us that were screaming on the wall that this is neo-fascism we're looking at it we're saying that the role the taking back of rights we're saying that that even with the without having the protection of the Voting Rights Act that we were saying that there was going to be the massive closing that going back to that first strategy the massive closing of polling sites that we're going to see voter ID we were going to see attacks all of those things that played themselves out and actually created the environment to make it that much more easy 
for us to see what we're seeing right now. And so now we're saying, we're, we're saying the alarm. I'm not so sure of just saying we're screaming the alarm right now around, regardless of whether your position is on a candidate, around democracy being threatened. I am interested in, as you all did with your, 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 your students and your conversations, do you think the belief that democracy is threatened, uh, that, that people actually believe that at the level in which you think the threat is? Joe Biden referred to the other side as semi-fascist. I mean, the thought that Joe Biden would ever accuse Republicans of being fascist while I mean, standing, that's pretty significant. That, I mean, that shows, that you, that shows you things have, things have changed. Mm -hmm. So not, not enough, but I mean, the point I was making earlier is in five short years, we've gotten to a point where very few people in the political establishment, left or right, thought there was a great threat to right. democracy. And now at least a, a good chunk of these, do they, are, they, are they serious enough? No. Um, do, are, they, are they willing to make sacrifices and step outside the box to defend democracy? Do they really, really get the house on fire? Only some of them. But there's much, the fact that we're discussing mm -hmm. this, um, that it's regularly talked about on, on, on television, CNN, and the newspapers, is a big change from five years ago, mm -hmm. and, a, and an important change. My, my earlier point was simply that we should be able to get to a point in, in five or 10 more years where we're talking seriously about democratizing reforms, making this country more democratic, building a multiracial democracy, achieving the vote for an easy vote, an easy access to the ballot for everybody. And that's something that I think can mobilize people looking forward. And so if we, if we change the conversation over the last five years, I think we can continue to change the conversation going forward. Okay, well thank you. What I wanna do is open up, we're open up for questions, so if you can make sure you ask a question with a question mark. <laughs> so I'll stop. Thank you, good evening. Uh, I'm from Brazil, and we will have elections on Sunday, and the front runner, uh, the, the current president, who is basically like following the same script that Trump, uh, from what Trump did in 2020 uh, here in the US. Uh, what is, in, and Professor Levitsky said that one of the basic rules is like, the leader is accepting the results of the election. And probably it's not gonna happen in Brazil. And not only uh, the leader will not accept the result of the election, but also a very important part of the electorate uh, won't accept or will think that elections were rigged. Uh, what, is, what are the lessons learned from the US election and process on how institutions, academia, civil society, uh, how to deal with that? Like to fight this kind of narrative at the same time that we don't alienate uh, that big part of the population. Thanks. Look, I don't know how many positive lessons we've, we've got. We're not in a in particularly good shape following the 2020 election. I mean, democracy survived. And one, one key lesson thinking about Brazil is the, 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 the principal reason why Donald Trump couldn't get away with his attempted autogolpe was that the armed forces refused to cooperate with right. his adventure. Right. So it will be very important, looking ahead at Brazil, that the, the armed forces stay on the sideline. Um, I'm hopeful that they will, but that's a big, a big question mark. The other, the other thing that's, that's really vital is, uh, and that didn't happen in the United States, so a negative lesson to learn from the United States, is politicians who know better have to stand up and tell the truth. Mm. The vast, vast majority of Republican Party politicians knew damn well and said in private that Biden won the election, but they wouldn't say it publicly. And that is what fomented the big, allowed the big lie to expand and contributed to what happened on, on January 6th. So it's very important that not only supporters of Lula, but that, in, important business figures from Sao Paulo and, uh, uh, and, and other losing candidates, that, that people from across the political spectrum, left to center right, all come out and say, okay, that's the result of elections, Bolsonaro lost, and, that, and, and, and that's the end of the discussion. And um, if the entire establishment 
if the, if the entire political spectrum outside the Bolsonaristas line up and very publicly and forcefully accept the results of the election, that will help. Will it, will it stop the 25% of, of hardcore Bolsonaristas from, from following you know, Bolsonaro anywhere? No, it won't. Uh, but it will, it will help. Uh, what, the, what, one, the one advantage uh, that Brazil has, hopefully, is that the margin of victory ought to be a lot greater. So um, you know, there, there's, a, there's at least a chance that Bolsonaro will be beaten so badly that it's very difficult uh, for him to, to overturn the election. The reason why Trump got as far as he got is it was a really close election. Really close election. Yeah. Thank you. Um, st sticking on that global scale, I'm very curious uh, to learn more about how is democratic backsliding interconnected? So for example, how does something like January 6th affect democracies in other parts of the world? Yeah, well, well that particular event is interesting. I mean, just bringing this back to Brazil, I mean, th these, these become kind of models. I mean, the US is an influential country. Uh, rhetorical tropes get imitated. Um, you know, I think this certainly happened during the Trump uh, presidency, that stuff he would say would then get picked up by other politicians in other countries, other similar sympathetic politicians. Um, and, you know, it's always this question, to what degree is, the, you know, there, is there a kind of authoritarian playbook? I mean, it's mm -hmm. clear they are using similar tactics. So in our book, How Democracies Die, we describe some of these tax tactics as capturing the referees of the states, you know, sort of capturing the course of apparatus, the legal apparatus, the courts, uh, <coughs> rigging electoral rules in a way to make it so it's harder to get voted out of office, going after the opposition. To what degree they're learning from each other is, is a bit of an open question, mm. um, you know, but I think it's because in some ways they all, all of these guys, what they have in common is a real instinct for power. And so they kind of sniff out where are the, where are the weaknesses in political systems. Um, so that, that, so I, but there, I think there is some imitation taking place, but I think broadly speaking, another point would be that the US for, despite its, the flaws of its democracy, for a long period had a foreign policy for you know, in the post-war period, especially since the end of the Cold War in particular, of supporting democracies. Um, and as the U.S. as a model has fallen into disrepute, it's, it's much harder to, to kind of point to the U.S. As, as, a, as a great, strong example around the world. And so as you see other countries, you know, coming up with alternative solutions, China, Singapore, you know, people begin to say, well, you know, what's so great about democracy? So I think this kind of global atmosphere plays a major role in making it easier to be a non-Democrat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a riveting conversation. I just looked up and saw a statistic that um, nearly two-thirds of poll respondents, this is an NPR Ipsos poll, two-thirds of poll responses agree the US, that US democracy is more at risk now than a year ago in 2021. And among Republicans, that number climbs to four and five. And overall, 70% of respondents agree that this country is in crisis and at risk of failing. That was shocking to read. And I'm wondering, between the tea leaves, it <coughs> feels like we're referencing a lot the other side. And this feels like something that both sides could agree on or do agree on by virtue of the poll. And so I wonder, do you think that there's potential to invite people from the other side to be in dialogue and engage in this subject matter together and model what it looks like if everyone agrees that we're gonna fail or at risk of fa failing, how do we collectively move forward? You know, it's, it's interesting. I'm, I can't wait to hear you all's answer to that. I wanna hear your answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, I, I think it's interesting, even in a poll, I, there's an assumption that they share the same understanding of what makes democracy. Right. That's where the flaw is, right? What the Republicans who are in power now see as democracy may be very different than, and so I, it, part, that is part of the tension, that where is this common ground around what is democracy and who should be able to participate in that democracy and where, who makes it legitimate, which is to your point around uh, norms. But anyway, that's, I, I just wanted to raise that, that I thought you know, the common ground is there's no common understanding, I don't think. I don't think there's yeah. a common understanding of And democracy. I wonder if we can engage in dialogue around that and, and that's, that's a, that. I mean, <laughs> I was gonna say the same thing as, as Natasha. It's, it's um, pe people are viewing the crisis 
very differently. Very differently. Right? If you ask a, a Trumpist, they'll say, well, elections are, are rigged and, and, and stolen, so what do we have to do? We need you know, uh, stricter voter ID laws and, and a whole set of regulations that make it harder for people to vote. That's right. Um, which is obviously different from what you'll hear from, from most and it's not, only, it's not only different, it's not like running ships passing the night, it's actually op op opposed it's diagnoses. It's opposed, is that meant And that, for that particular example. Right, so I'm not, I'm not particularly hopeful about dialogue between the two sides right now because I think the Republican Party is, a, is an anti-democratic political force. And I think they need to be beaten politically. Mm. What, and, and one, you know, and there's lots of political science research coming out you know, these days now where people sort of discover that you know, people tend to think their democracy is working when the side, the things that, that they like are getting passed. And so there is, you know, these terms are, you know, so it's, so that's why it's so critical to have these shared kind of basic norms of like, well, you just, you know, you realize, okay, I, I lost, so let the other side win, let the other side win. I mean, that's how it goes. So I, you know, I, I, I guess I agree, I agree with uh, this. <laughs> I, but, but I guess I would say, you know, to step back from it, I mean, it's maybe it's, it's you know, this is a sign of a deconsolidating democracy. <laughs> That's what this is a sign of. When both sides think that the democracy is in crisis, and both sides think the other side, if the other side wins, it, this is a nightmare and a disaster, that's a sign of a deconsolidating of democracy. A, and that's, what, that's the system that we're living in. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yeah, you talked really persuasively about the ways in which this, the roots of America's democratic crisis begin with the civil rights movement, or at least the seeds of it are planted in um, the greater inclusion and the, you know, the threats to a white Christian majority. How then do we think about the global wave of authoritarianism and autocracy, um, which obviously doesn't have exactly the same roots? Great question. First of all, I think sometimes the global wave of autocracy is overstated. There are more democracies today in the world than there were in the mid-1990s, many more. There are more democracies than, than, there were, than there were in the year 2000. There are four or five fewer democracies than there were 10 years ago. So um, there, is, uh, there, there are threats to democracy today that didn't exist or that are stronger than there were 20 years ago. The primary reason for that is, the, is, a, is a change in global balance of power. Um, we, our reference point, when we talk about a global crisis of democracy, our reference point is a very odd, unique period in history, the 1990s. The Soviet Union collapsed, and for about 15 years, the liberal West, the United States and Western Europe, were the dominant hegemonic political, military, economic, and cultural force on Earth. And during that period, when the, when the, when lib when the liberal West and, and its institutions were the only game in town, elites across the world had to be, at least pretend to be democracies, if not be democracies. That was a, an unusually favorable international environment for democracy that was never gonna be sustained. When the world inexorably and inevitably became a more multipolar place, as, as Russia regained strength and became more aggressive, as China gained in strength, as the liberal West, in part because of self goals, but in part because of self, self soccer goals, meaning, you know, uh, mistakes, but uh, uh, in part because of, of, of an inevitable decline, the, the, the liberal West lost its hegemony mm. and it was, uh, it, the, the, the international environment became less favorable for democracy. And so it's not a shocker, it shouldn't be a shock, it shouldn't shock anyone that um, particularly countries that are, um, that are more peripheral where conditions for democracy are not as favorable, that democracy is in some trouble. That's, that's what the global crisis of democracy is about. There are similar patterns, somewhat similar patterns to what's going on in the United States in Western Europe. As societies are becoming more diverse due to immigration, there is a right-wing reaction, uh, as we began this conversation talking about, uh, that uh, you know, Western Europe also has to grapple with multiracial democracy, and it's also gonna be ugly and polarizing there. Uh, maybe not quite as polarizing as here, but, um, I, I actually think that it's that the crisis of democracy in the United States is not really the same story as the global crisis of democracy that people talk about, which I think in general is somewhat exaggerated. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Thanks so much. So you talk about how like violating democratic norms is a big part of how sort of democratic backsliding happens. My question is about how we as 
Democrats, multiracial, sort of small d Democrats, think about norms that prevent us from launching a vigorous challenge to sort of avowedly anti democratic parties. I'm thinking about norms uh, to do with filibuster, Senate apportionment, um, electoral college, and things like that. Um, this seems like a sort of real dilemma to me, and how do you think about um, movements uh, from the Democratic Party to, to amend these norms? So those are rules, those are not norms. Those are all written down rules that you just mentioned. And, and what about I, the filibuster? That's a rule. It's a Senate rule. It's not a constitutional rule, but it's a Senate rule. Yeah, so, so, the, question is how, so the question is that, 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 that challenging those rules seems to be challenging uh, the, the established norms, is that, is that the... Is that the uh, yes, yeah. well, I mean, if we're worried about sort of yeah. a like yeah. back well, and forth cycle of right, yeah. yeah. I mean, the thing to remember is that democracies are always reforming; they're always changing. They're always and, they, and institutional reforms happens happen throughout history. The question is, are the institutional reforms making our political system more democratic or less democratic? So, when uh, fem women gain the right to vote uh, through a constitutional amendment, one could have said at the time, "Well, this is challenging existing norms." That's true; it's one hundred percent true. But it was making our political system more democratic. So it was a reform that was a pro-democratic reform. It was challenging existing norms of gender hierarchy. On the other hand, if you have an institutional reform that, that restricts the right to vote in the post-Reconstruction era, you could say that's challenging a norm that was established in the Civil War and during the Reconstruction era. That's true, it's challenging a norm, but it's, an, it's challenging, it's, it's instituting an anti-democratic rule. So I think, and so the question then becomes, well, you know, the, the way to evaluate these institutional reforms is to have some conception of what democracy is, which to my mind means more participation, more anything that increases participation, anything that increases competition, anything that protects civil liberties, those are, those, that's what democracy is. And so any reform that does that, even if it's challenging norms, is a democratic reform. Thank you for your question. I'm wondering if you could talk about the role that money plays in the decline of democracy, and um, especially in relation to, you talked about, you know, politicians respond to public pressure, social movements, and I think that money complicates that idea a little bit. So I'm wondering if you could talk about that. That's yeah, a good question. Yeah, well, we, you know, we, 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 we haven't mentioned it, right? right? So we don't talk about it a lot. So that's, thank you for asking the question. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly, Big money is a violation of the principle. Big money having an outsized voice is a, has a violation of the principle of political equality. You know, so everybody has one vote, but if somebody has more money and that shapes candidates' positions uh, through very lax campaign finance rules, which we have in the United States due to Supreme Court decisions, that's a problem for democracy because it means unequal voice. It distorts our politics. It means that popular public policies get thwarted. Um, what's and, and, so, so I think it's a challenge, you're absolutely right. An, an, another point though I would add is that there's lots of money on both sides, um, in, in the United States at least, and so that, I mean, that, you know, that maybe isn't entirely reassuring, but it, what I think it would be particularly bad if one side had all the resources, and I think what one sees in backsliding, cases of democratic backsliding, is when, the incum when all the business line aligns with the incumbent. So like take Hungary, for example. After a, a, you know, 12 years in power, Viktor Orban has all of business essentially on his side. And there is no business sector opposed to him. And this allows, so big money plays a role here, but it's, it's tilted and eight, entirely asymmetric. And so in some sense, you know, ba big, big money is a problem, but at least at the moment so far in the United States, a kind of a sign of good news is that there's money on both sides at least. And if there weren't money on both sides, we'd really be in trouble, actually. About uh, 20 years ago at a panel that I was on with uh, Kennedy School professor Ricardo Hausman, uh, Professor Hausman, uh, talking about economic crisis, said uh, a, a, an important point, which is there are many ways to die. Uh, there are many ways for democracy to be sick. And uh, the, the role of money in American politics is a sickening factor. Uh, it's, it's important. We don't focus on it because we don't think it's a problem to be, it, it's a, it weakens our democracy and it's a problem that needs to be addressed. It's not the central problem that is driving the, it's the, the threat. It is not what pushed the Republican Party into authoritarianism. Race is what pushed the Republican Party into authoritarianism. So it is seven o'clock, we have time for, I'm gonna take one last question. I saw you standing up there for a long time. I'm so sorry. <laughs> 
I saw you stand in it. So if you could just quickly ask your prep question and then we'll wrap Thank up. Thank you very much. I'd like to talk again about democratic backsliding quickly. We see it around the world. In Myanmar, we've seen it in consolidating young democracies, but we also see it in Eastern Europe. And many of us here go to the Kennedy School, Kennedy School will be future policymakers. So I'd like to know what your advice is to future policymakers to restore faith in the liberal narrative around the world. Hmm. <laughs> Oh, I want to know that answer. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, you know, I think one thing that we underappreciate, the un under, under, uh, sort of underappreciated heroes of the Trump era were people, professionals, peoples in position of some power, whether you're a journalist, whether you're a civil servant, whether you're a military officer, who are in, in, under incredible pressure to do powerful, corrupt politicians' bidding. And you know, authoritarian systems survive when these kinds of actors don't mm -hmm. stand up to authoritarians. Um, and so it takes some courage, it, but it also requires a commitment to professional ethos. You know, whether one's you know, a lawyer, you know, subscribing to the kind of ethics requirements of a bar association, a legal, you know, professional association, or a journalist subscribing to professional ethos requ uh, required of journalists. This kind of stuff actually makes a difference. And so th this is sort of invisible because it's just people doing their jobs. And so mm -hmm. in some sense, it's not very glamorous. It's not very heroic. Every once in a while, we'll get these glimpses of it when there's some, you know, some you know, civil servant, um, somebody working in the State Department who you know, listened in on a call you know, with, with President Trump and then has to testify in front of Congress. And we see these people, and they're kind of these remarkable heroes. But there's thousands of these people that were critical, I think, in defeating authoritarianism over the last four years in the United States. United States. So I think that, so at, at a very kind of simple level, you know, doing your job mm. is remarkably powerful. If I can answer that question very briefly from a completely different angle, uh, it's important <laughs> not to lose hope. I mean, it, it's, it's simply not true that democracies are collapsing across the globe and that Democrats aren't fighting back. We hear about, we, the, the, the Venezuelas and the Thailands and the Hungries and the Indias are, first of all, very important. Second of all, they're very salient in our mind. But if you actually look for, and, and Myanmar was never a democracy, I'm sorry. Mm. Um, if you, for every Hungary, there is a, uh, a, um, a Sri Lanka or Honduras or a, an Ecuador where democracy is clamoring its way back. Uh, there are folks fighting for democracy in Iran right now. Uh, in, in, uh, in Malaysia, in Armenia, Sri Lanka in recent years. Um, democracy is, is under threat across the world, but democracies are also surviving and proving strikingly resilient despite really, really difficult circumstances these last five years. Latin America remains overwhelmingly democratic despite terrible conditions. Um, I, I don't say that so that, we, um, that, that so that we don't worry about it, but I think it's important to keep perspective that democracy continues to, to stand a fighting chance. So given that, what I want to do just as we wrap up, you've told us we're, both of you, we're on a rocky ro ride for the next 10 years. I just want to leave by asking you a simple question, real quick. What gives you hope? Quick. What gives you hope? I, 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 th I think in the United States, I think most Americans are really uh, tolerant and more so than any point in American history. And there are certainly segments that aren't, but you know, I think the American people, in fact, it's our institutions that are the problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I would say the younger generation. Mm -hmm. Looking at public opinion among uh, 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 Gen X and Gen, not Gen X, not Gen X is my guess, uh, uh, millennials and Gen Z. And millennials. Uh, <laughs> much, much more open, mm -hmm. much more tolerant, much more open to diversity right. and multiracialism than any generation that ever preceded them. And I think they're the ones that are gonna get us there. Thank you so much. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> and thank you all for attending tonight. We will not allow democracy.